Hi, my name is Dilip Ramachandra. I'm the CEO of Mini. Mini is a transformational company that is bringing the Silicon Valley mindset to upskilling global talent as well as building products that will improve developer productivity. I'm also the author of the book Gangster Vision, and that's what you're here for. You see one of my readings uh, in the book. And Gangster Vision was written for primarily was written for product managers who kind of got into a rut. They're feeling stuck in their career, want to make the jump to the next level into leadership. Sometimes it could be small teams, it could be leading an entire product organization. Uh, but I found the book to be really helpful for people from all kinds of backgrounds. Um, dentists, <laughs> optometrists, um, I've heard great feedback from engineering managers. I've heard feedback from a realtor. So I think it's, just, it's really a book about unleashing yourself. And it's about you know this idea of finding your purpose through true ownership and then committing to it. And there's a lot of stories to back that. And it's really a book that's intended to inspire you um, to do the thing that you just keep telling yourself that you want to do, but you haven't done yet. So this particular chapter today will be an interesting one. It's uh, chapter 12 called uh, Senior Leadership Superpowers. So with that, I'll get started. <coughs> Dilip, I think you should look for another job. The CEO wants you gone. Mm, I remember this moment. It was uh, pretty scary. <laughs> yeah, it was. Back in chapter 2, I described my experience at Galagan. It was the first time I hit my ceiling when I brushed up against my manager and a clear career path for myself didn't emerge. There were other indicators as well. At this stage of my career, one would expect to be primarily learning, but I had shifted to doing a lot of teaching. That was totally fine because I saw the fruits of my labor, upskilling a team to learn modern product development practices. I wanted more, and to get to the next stage of growth, I needed to find new things to learn. Within a few days of hearing this news from my manager, I was prompted into action. I thought to myself, I don't deserve this. How is this happening again? I've been working so hard. I had fallen into a cycle, and I didn't know how to break through. When I looked at the roles at Torian and Galagan, I felt there was something similar about them I wanted to dig deep into. into. My mind immediately went to the experience with my headhunter who found me to join the Galagan team. I remembered that during the salary negotiation, the recruiter didn't feel justified in paying a fair wage to me. They felt someone with my level of experience shouldn't be compensated more. This wasn't the case with Torian. I received the job with a fairly meaningful raise. That made me think, was the raise was that the raise so substantial because I was underpaid before? I reflected on this further. It could be possible these companies might have chosen me for the job because I was a value hire. That is, someone willing to accept a lower wage than the average applicant, but with more years of experience compared to the average on paper. On paper. Right? That's an important point. Imposter syndrome is a psychological phenomenon and feeling that you don't deserve your job despite all your accomplishments in the workplace. And this is such an interesting story that it comes up again and again. I've mentored so many people. Just somebody I talked to uh, a week and a half ago, she was going through the same exact thing. So it's uh, that's why I picked this chapter today to, to do the reading out for. It's more common than you think. Okay, back to the reading. Did I sound better on paper than my actual ability to perform? The imposter syndrome creeped in, and these thoughts terrified me, and momentarily, momentarily held me back from taking risks for fear of failure. No, I wouldn't accept it. It didn't make logical sense. I received excellent performance reviews at every single company. Of course, the outlier was the performance improvement plan I received at Torian that we came across in Chapter 5. The teaching there was I had to do a much better job telling the story of my value. That helped explain what one must do to stay in a job. But what about picking the right job? Was that the mistake I was making? Aha. Uh -huh. You won. <laughs> this was fundamentally the issue I faced across both jobs. You see, companies need to hire people to get certain projects completed. Beyond those projects, it is up to the candidate and the manager to figure out what to do next. In other words, a career map for you isn't guaranteed to be created for you by your hiring manager. You need to be responsible for making sure it is created, especially longer term. You know, when somebody's hiring you for a role, they're probably thinking at least three to six months, maybe a year, even at bigger companies. Beyond that, you gotta figure out like the product is gonna evolve or the operational impacts that you're making in an operational role is gonna continue and you need to continue to 
fixed, and you have to take some responsibility. As a candidate for a job, it is your responsibility to evaluate if this job and this manager can create the ideal career map for you. At director le level roles or higher, create that career map yourself. In this context, you need to determine and express to the hiring manager your capacity, confidence, and capability to do this. Now that I finally had an awareness of how to break the cycle, I could create a plan. Before I took the next job, I started looking at a lot more criteria in addition to location, company culture, and compensation. They were attributes such as, and I learned from this one, is this an industry that I'm motivated to stay in for at least five years? When reviewing the product portfolio, what is the capacity for this product to grow? Looking at the organizational hierarchy, is there space for me to grow? If I want to make it into senior leadership, will this job teach me the skills to get there? Do I respect and believe in the senior leadership at this company? Is there a good way to understand the value of the company's equity? Is there room for growth? Does this company have a good business model? Is it on the path to success? If not, what can I do to get them there? As you read these attributes, you might find many are related to each other. You might also find some answers might contradict each other. But this is a good thing, as it gives you the areas to focus on to ask additional questions to determine if the contradiction is a problem or not. Sometimes it's not. You want to leverage your bets. You want to hedge your bets. So some of this, some of these items here are contradicting on purpose, and you want to use it as a way to experiment the different ways your career could go. You're not 100 percent sure yet. Answering these questions helps build some long-term thinking around your ability to make an impact at this company. I asked my manager that question. How much time do I have before the CEO makes his decision? About two to three months. The way I approached this new job search was entirely different. I started reaching out for opportunities through my network. I did apply to jobs as well, but not every single one I saw on LinkedIn. I focused on jobs fitting my requirements. As I raised the bar for the company I wanted to work for, Obviously, the bar would be raised on the type of candidates the company accepts as well. This is another thing that uh, came up again very recently with two of my mentees. Um, they had they would they would get a job, you know, after interviewing for four hours after the interview, right? and they they're used to that for the past many years. And then they went through this process, and then they started leveling up, you know, themselves and leveling up the kind of roles they want to go into. And they found that oh, you know, it's much harder to get a job now. The competition is is also amped up now. You know, and you're demanding from role, responsibility, compensation, things that others want too. And so then uh, the playing field changes a little bit. So you gotta react to that. I need to build a better public brand to tell the story of my value. Additionally, I also had to exhibit, as it pertained to my field of product management, a track record of building successful software products. Since most of my experience was with enterprise business to business products, I could tell stories and create mockups, but I couldn't show the actual products themselves. Despite all of this, I got a fantastic job as director of product management at Ferris Platform. This was a job that helped me break this cycle. It was a difficult and challenging job. I grew tremendously, both in my ability to influence and grow my craft during my time at the company. During this job search, there were other jobs out of my reach. I concluded that I would get there through entrepreneurship. I knew there was a limit to the skills I could learn at my day job, and therefore decided I would pick a passion project and build it myself. Around that time in my life, my circle of friends spent our weekends traveling around California and exploring new cities. The task of itinerary planning, and especially within a budget, was a major pain point. I decided this was a problem I would focus on solving. I teamed up with a good friend of mine, Ian Andal. Ian and I worked together at Torian and shared a passion for travel and turned out to be the go-to trip planners in our circle of friends. He also had the same itch for entrepreneurship. We built PlanGuru.com, an expert travel concierge, offering boutique trip planning for clients. As part-time founders, we ran PlanGuru.com for over a year. Even though we had an early product market fit, in the end, we couldn't scale the business for a few years. Number one, we brought on a technical founder who did not align with our personal values and work ethic. This member did not meet milestones, so it was a painful process to remove him from the team. We underestimated the importance of the working relationship between early members. The product we tried to sell was something users were not used to paying for, who didn't anticipate this distribution channel. Building travel software was new to us, so we just didn't think through the concepts obvious 
to impact trends on this one. Most of our energy was spent tweaking the price, the positioning of the product, and ultimately the unique economics didn't make sense. We waited too long to go from concept to prototype. Ideally, we should have found this out much sooner. And you know, summarizing that experience there, we spent a lot more time on the people challenge than the product challenge. The product challenge was too planned out, but you know, to blindside us, it was actually kind of a frustrating time during then, but a, but a great time. Therefore, we decided the effort to continue to grow this business outweighed the ability to offer a cost effective. But it gave us more than we ever expected. It provided us both of us with a plethora of skills we wouldn't have been exposed to in our daily jobs. As a founder of a startup selling travel services, it taught me the empathy required for cold calling and sales. The job taught Ian how to take his decade of marketing experience to build a brand from the ground up. And since it was a two-person startup, the value was really us. We both got practice pitching our own brand. As I worked to break out of my cycle through learning to be better at picking jobs, I also found a way to use entrepreneurship to accelerate the development of my leadership superpowers. I believed I was lucky to achieve this career. Others may not be that lucky. Anurag Burma is the former host of the This is Product Management podcast. This po- monthly podcast has been live for over 290 episodes of Primer by Now. And has several hundreds of hours of stories of how great product leaders make good decisions. I asked Anurag, can you explain why is it so hard for product managers to shift their perspective? He answered with a healthy dose of philosophy. Why do some people stay in a poverty cycle? Why? For people to break out, it almost always comes down to information asymmetry. That's how you get any advantage in the world. You need access to knowledge that others don't have. And that is how you break a cycle information asymmetry. One way to look at it is to make the best decisions with the information available to you. Another way is to accept that there's information others might have that helps them make better decisions than you. For me, I saw the latter very clearly. It was a reminder of the poor decisions I made in my career. As we dug into my experience at Galagan, asking questions was a way to combat this issue to transition into a more long-term way. I also had to build my brand and do a better job telling my story. I researched the ways one could get access to the information they needed to see the blind spots and shift their perspective. As a mercenary product manager, you might find yourself hitting these ceilings again and again with no idea how to break the cycle. With these four leadership superpowers we will explore in the rest of this chapter, you will shift your mindset to that of a missionary product manager who exhibits true ownership. Um, I'm going to pause right there because there's a lot more here. So I think in the next four videos I'll do each superpower as a single video it's kind of easier to consume content thanks for listening until next time unleash yourself cheers